Well, good morning, church. As we prepare our minds to study the Word of God and worship God through the avenue of the Word of God this morning, I want to invite you to turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 22. That's going to be the last chapter of the last book of your Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Uh, in the first month of this year, we've unveiled our theme, and our theme is living life on a mission. And as part of that, we've also unveiled five very simple things that you can do to begin to make a difference in the world around you. Malcolm came up with this really neat graphic behind me on the screen where we take our word share and we see what each of those letters mean. To share a meal with somebody this week. To help a need that you see in someone's life this week. To assemble for worship and to learn God's will. And as you're talking or eating or helping with somebody, you relate spiritually to them regarding the problems that they may have in their lives. And E is evangelize simply, meaning you invite somebody to a Bible class, invite uh, to, you know, them to read the Bible with you, uh, or here's the perfect opportunity. Next Sunday, we'll have our all-in-one Sunday. We'll have a potluck luncheon. And that's the perfect opportunity for you to invite somebody to come along. It's a, it's a very simple way for you to engage in a, a simple way to evangelize this week. I would love for everybody in this church to bring somebody with them uh, next Sunday as we worship God together and bring glory to God in that way. As you look at the Bible, it's pretty evident that it's a very large, millennia-spanning story. What I, mean, what I mean by millennia spanning, I mean, I mean, we're talking about thousands of years this story has been unfolding from the time of creation all the way through the time of the patriarchs of the Old Testament and the prophets of the Old Testament and the times of the kings and on into the time of Jesus. And now we find ourselves right here, right now in the 21st century living as God's people. And we know this big story starts in the Garden of Eden, and it ends with the return of Jesus. And sometimes it's good for us to go all the way to the end of the story and to look at what we have yet to take place, what we're looking forward to, the thing that we're hopeful for in the return of Christ. So that's what we're going to do here this morning as we study from the book of Revelation. Now I want to start out in Revelation 22. We'll read a couple of verses that Mike read for us a few moments ago. And then we'll go even further in the text. We'll start out together in verse 12. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. And that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside of the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters. And everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David. The bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. In verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. What a beautiful section of Scripture. It's the end of the big story. The thing we're looking forward to. And we call it the end of the story. But I want to kind of, allow, I want to kind of lead our minds to, to think of it in, in maybe just a little bit different light. C.S. Lewis wrote a very famous series of books there were works of fiction, fiction, fantasy works of fiction. 
And as the last of those volumes was finishing up, called The Last Battle, this book and all of these stories really are meant to symbolize our faith in the Christian, uh, in the Christian faith. And listen to what Lewis writes. Listen to what he says. He says, he's closing out The Last Battle, the very end of the book. He says, the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. Listen. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every, listen, in which every chapter is better than the one before. I love how Lewis describes this because he is very clearly making an allusion to the book of Revelation. And what he's saying is that the life we've been living right now the one right here on earth, in reality, is just the cover story to the bigger story that has yet to be told. We have yet to start that one. That story starts after the return of Jesus. And he says that story goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. And I want that reality, don't you? I want that to be right here and right now. And as I think about that, the end of Revelation is sort of inviting us to think about every day in eternity with God is better than the day before. Every new chapter of that existence is better than anything we ever could have realized before. So we're just sort of left wanting more from Scripture as the book of Revelation ends out. And what I want to do today is I want to give us the major themes because Revelation 22 is just summarizing all the major themes of the entire book. And the thing what I want to do really is you look on the inside of your bulletin there. I want to give us two things that will help us to get our minds right about the book of Revelation. We're going to do that really quickly, back to back. And then I'm going to give you four major things that you see here in Revelation 22 that really remind us of the big themes of the book of Revelation itself. Let's start out with those two things that are going to help us to think rightly about this book. Number one, Revelation is not intended to promote hopeless speculation about the future. And I invite you to write that down. The book of Revelation was never meant for us to hopelessly speculate about what's coming up in the future. The interesting thing is, in the first century, when the first readers got a hold of, the co of a copy, first copies of the book of Revelation, they didn't, they didn't start going around the countryside giving prophecy seminars and, and creating these complex systems and charts and descriptions of the end times. There was none of that. That's not why the book of Revelation was written to begin with. And the first Christians didn't deal with Revelation in that way. Let me tell you how they dealt with Revelation. When they read that book, they were Christians who were suffering incredibly. Every day they were dying in the arena. Every day they were being killed for their faith. They couldn't have work because they would not confess Caesar as Lord and instead Jesus was Lord to them. And because of that lack of confession, they could not work. They were facing temptation every day. Persecution on all sides. They didn't care about charts. They didn't care about prophecy seminars. The book of Revelation isn't there to create hopeless speculation. What it is there for, number two, is to fuel hopeful obedience for the future. <coughs> Revelation is written for them then, but also has that same effect for us right now. Not to promote all kinds of speculation, but rather to fuel our obedience right here and right now. The interesting thing is, when you open up your Bible, anytime the Bible talks about the end times, it always includes this message about being obedient 
in light of the future. So let me invite you to do something really quickly. I want to invite you to take your Bible ribbon and kind of put it right there where you are and back up a few books to the book of 2 Peter. And we'll look at 2 Peter chapter 3 for just a few moments and some words there which kind of inform us and help us to see a bigger picture about the end of the Bible. You know, it's no different from today, back in Paul's day or or back in the Apostle Peter's day, they were asking some of these same questions. When is Jesus coming back? Is Jesus coming back? Maybe he's not coming back, some of them were saying, because it didn't seem like it was happening fast enough for them as they were dying for their faith. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter begins to, to write. He says, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. And in both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, the scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. And they will say, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Verse 5, Peter says they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago too and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, that is water, the world that then existed was deluged, covered with water and perished. But by the same word, verse 7, the heavens and earth that now exist are being stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Watch verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. And the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, here we get to the point, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of godliness and holiness? When the Bible talks about the end times, it's trying to stir us up to obedience, to being ready for that moment. So this isn't about speculation. This is about hopeful obedience for the future, looking forward and hastening that day to come. The Bible's really telling us to be ready, to live in holiness. And so that's why in that reading in Revelation 22, go back to it. Notice how the Bible ends. It's got a balance between blessings and warnings. Not just, oh, verse 5 will be in the presence of God's face forever and ever. But after that, all of that, but watch out. Don't be a scoffer. Don't be amongst those who live lives in an ungodly fashion. You be ready in obedience. I want to say to you, man, Scripture is a living, breathing thing. It's a two-edged sword. It's the water that really causes your faith to grow. Scripture has a task to perform in my life and in your life. And that task is to create obedience and readiness in our hearts. So let me, as briefly as I can, give you these four themes and they are as living and active and breathing for us right here, right now, at the end of January 2017, as they were back then in the first century when they first read of them. Here's your first thing. See the world in all its deception. See the world in all its deception. Let's play that out for a moment. In the book of Revelation, there are some really big themes and images. I mean, as you read Revelation, it paints pictures in your mind. And one of those pictures is an image of a beast. And in the book of Revelation, the beast represents 
the governing power, the empire and the emperor, the one who was putting Christians to death. The thing about that is, the Apostle John, as he writes, and really at the command of Jesus, he's saying, never ever put your ultimate trust in the emperor and the empire in whom there is no salvation. They're imperfect systems. And you can't bow the knee to the empire. You can't bow the knee to the emperor. And I don't care what your political persuasion is. I'm not talking about politics at all. I'm talking about your faith. Your faith belongs to Jesus, your only king. And that's one of the warnings of the book of Revelation. And in fact, one of the ironic texts is Psalm 146 and verse 3, which says, Do not trust in princes or in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. What's really interesting about that is most of the Psalms were written by Israel's greatest princes, King David, King Solomon. And here at the end of the Psalms it says, Don't put your trust in mere men. You remember who your God is. And that'll see you through the cross. And here's another one of the big images of Revelation, and that is the false prophets. Don't be led astray by religious systems that are going to bring you away from Christ or oppose Christ. Don't let anything draw you out of the church of our Lord. Understand who you are. Believe in what we stand for. Because we stand in that great 2,000 year old tradition of the church of the firstborn. So that's one of those big images. And then a third big image is the image of Babylon, which is all through the book of Revelation, which in Revelation stands for Rome. Rome and all its seductive power. Come have status. Come live like the world lives. Come engage in sexual immorality. Come engage in all kinds of, of, of deeds that are unspeakable. Revelation tells us that's the world in which they live. Hey, it's the world in which we live right now. And the Bible's reminding us, Revelation's reminding us, are you listening? That the greatest danger to Christians is never the danger of persecution from the world. The greatest danger to Christians is seduction by the world. Because they, they live through both. <laughs> And they lived directly through persecution by the world. The real danger was seduction by the world. To compromise little by little by little, day by day by day, until all of a sudden they turned around and realized they were far from Christ. And you can see that reflected in some of those seven early churches that are talked about at the beginning of the book of Revelation. John the Apostle reminds us, do not love the world or the things of the world. And that's that's tied directly into this idea of the image of Babylon the Great, the city that seduces Christians away from their faith. Don't tie your life into things and your family into things that aren't going to last. But if the first theme is see the world and all its deception, I think the second theme is where we come in back of that with great news. And that is to see the Christ in all his glory. So see the world in its deception, but also see the Christ in all his glory. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse out of the book says this is a revelation, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with the text here. This is a revelation about Jesus Christ, based on everything else in the book of Revelation. I believe it's a revelation about Jesus. Not just containing information about. Over the years I've read uh, a lot of works by a lot of old theologians. A lot of whom I agreed with and a lot of whom I didn't agree with. And one guy who, whether you agree with him or not, is always interesting to read is a guy by the name of Martin Luther. Luther had some good things to say. Luther had a lot of things I disagreed with him on. But one of the things that Luther wrote that I just cannot wrap my mind around when he commented on the book of Revelation, he said, this book really has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And I read that and I think, did you actually read it? He's 
in the first verse. There's this huge, beautiful description of him all throughout chapter 1. Beginning in verse 5, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Whenever you read Revelation in the right way, you're going to trust and love Jesus more, and you're also going to be a little bit afraid of him. The book does that to you. For the last many years, I've had the privilege of teaching the book of Revelation at Cree Hall. And i got to tell you something. Every time I get to the end of it, I just want to cry out with John and say, Return, Lord Jesus. Come back now. And I feel a hint of sadness in my heart because this book always draws me so much closer to the person of Christ. In the beginning of the book, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And then, like two big bookends in Revelation, the end of the book repeats that. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is eternal, fully divine. He knows no beginning. He knows no end. His wisdom is knows no bounds. Revelation 1.14, look at it. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, symbolizing wisdom like snow. His purity has no error. His power knows no equal. Look at verses 15 and 16 of Revelation 1. His feet like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace, reminding us of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His voice like the roar of many waters. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in full strength. Verse 14, eyes like the flame of fire. What can you hide from this Lord? What sin can you cover that he cannot see? What deed can you engage in that he'll never know? He was dead for a time, but alive for all time. Revelation 1.18, I died. Behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Revelation 5, the Lamb is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. He was slain, and by his blood he ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And we know his promises are faithful because he's called the faithful witness. His words at the end of Revelation are trustworthy and true. In Revelation 19, he is the warrior riding back into the world on a white horse, assaulting evil on every side. And his grace is free and his joy is full. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. For all we know, that could be tomorrow. And I wish it would be. So when you think of Jesus, I want to ask you a simple question. Do you think of him in all the various facets the book of Revelation reminds you to think about? Do you think about him on all of these levels in his deepest wonder and power? There's a third thing. See the church in all her beauty. The astonishing thing is that Jesus all throughout over and over again, confesses his deep and abiding love for those who are his people. In fact, you where you sit right now, you are of infinite worth to Jesus. He loves you so much it's beyond description. And Revelation gives us a picture of the bride of Jesus, the church, through the eyes of the groom. Now, what, what, what groom is standing there on his wedding day and the bride starts coming down the aisle? Every one of those grooms that sees something like that, when you see that image, you think, wow, she looks great. This is beautiful. She's beautiful. What a beautiful event. All of those things go around and through your mind. 
Now imagine the bride through the eyes of Jesus. And you'll start to get a glimpse of how much you are loved by Jesus your Lord. There's a last thing, and it's this one. See your life then in proper perspective. You see the world in all its deception, Christ in all his glory, the church in all her beauty, but now you see your own life in proper perspective. You don't look at the world the way the world teaches you to look. Can I give you a heads up? Well, even, if, even if it feels right to you, that's the exact definition in the Bible of what sin is. If it feels right to you, it's probably wrong. Because the world always wants to bend you away from the will of God and to make it feel right. The only way you can know for certain is if you're living your life in accordance with His will through obedient living, watchful living. See your life in proper perspective. Don't be seduced by the world to live as the world lives. You fight against sin. And when you start in your life fighting tooth and nail against sin, you're going to start to see all the devastation that sin is bringing into your life all around you. All the relationships that start to blow up. All the hurt that begins to be caused. You didn't even see it before, but now when you start fighting against that, so now you see it. Now it starts to make sense to you. Now you see its devastation. Revelation is urging us, don't compromise. Don't give in. You be faithful. And here's the promise that's echoed over and over and over in the book of Revelation. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and hears. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Revelation promises a special blessing on those who would be obedient to the words of this book. What about you? Let's pray about it. Father, here this morning, uh, we're just astonished at this book and what it contains. We thank you for a snapshot at the end. We thank you for the reminder that it really isn't the end. It's the beginning of something greater than we could have known. So, Father, today I just thank you for your word for what your word has accomplished here in this place, among us, and for what your will has accomplished through your son, Jesus. We see him in all his glory today as you intended. And we give you glory for that. Today, would you help us to know and to be reminded of the importance of our obedience to you, to be ready. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. So as we close out, I'm going to echo some words of the Apostle Peter. Where he says in 2 Peter 3.12, that in the meantime, are you ready? We're to be waiting for and hastening the day of his return. Hastening it. Doing everything in our power to make it a reality right here and right now. That's through the way you live your life. That's in the difference that you're to be making in the people in your life. I mean, what, where is your life right now? Knowing that all these things will take place, what sort of lives ought you to live in holiness and in godliness? Let's consider it as we stand and say. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives.